<laughs> yes. Okay. I'd like to call to order the uh, November 30th Concord Carlisle Regional Committee. And I'll call the Concord School Committee meeting to order. Anderson present. Booth present. Morano present. Mustafi present. Rainey present. Wilson present. So we'll start with hi, Darcy. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, it's good to see you. Um, I know that uh, you wanted us to prepare a sustainability report for this week. And Harry unfortunately couldn't be here because he has work, um, but we did prepare some things and we'd be happy to discuss it uh, if that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can begin. Um, so um, first we kind of looked at some of the different clubs that are working on sustainability. Um, so the first one and probably the most prominent one right now at CC is Green Team, which is run um, by a few seniors who are the presidents of the club. And they're working on making CCHS a more sustainable place. Um, and one of their big missions they're working on right now is composting in the cafeteria. So they're working on doing a lot of composting. Um, and so far I've spoken to a few of the club members and they're saying that it's going pretty well, but it is a quite new initiative. Um, they also worked on making a pollinator garden recently. Um, so that's kind of hoping to attract bees and other things so that we have a prettier school area. Um, and then there's another club that's working on sustainability called the Sunrise Club. And that's a part of the bigger Sunrise movement. Um, and that's also, this is a new club this year, so that's exciting. And they're kind of, they're a political action organization that advocates for political action on climate change. Um, so they're, right now they're doing a lot more advocacy work and then um, I believe fundraising as well is another thing that they're doing. Um, and I've spoken to a few of their club members um, and I've been to a few, I've been to um, one of their meetings and um, they're doing a, a great job on trying to get that more in the open and more of a bigger um, club at CCHS in their first year. Um, and then there's another club called the Environmental Club. And right now, um, some of their bigger things are releasing Blanding's turtles into the wild, um, kind of doing different nature walks and hikes and um, looking at the local wildlife and then doing more sustainability projects. Um, and then kind of Harry and I talked about the general attitudes sort of towards sustainability at the high school. Um, so while there's some particularly motivated students, such as the club members and leaders of these three um, majorly focused sustainability clubs at the high school, um, we do notice that the general student population does seem to have um, not necessarily the best care sometimes for sustainability. Um, this year in particular, there has been a lot of complaints by staff uh, for littering and trashing the campus as well as just um, kind of uh, mindful attitudes in the cafeteria and other places about cleaning up trash and everything, especially since this is such a new building. Um, there is like the hope to make it as clean as possible, um, but there have been all other kind of uh, things trying to change this around a little bit, such as student government, which is similar to Senate, which we're a part of, um, and they did a campus cleanup recently, um, and that had a lot of members involved and there's community service um, and it was all across the school. So that had great participation. Um, and then I know trash trucks also came on here a few weeks back and they're doing a great job at trying to clean up the skate park. And they kind of told you about their mission, but um, they're also, I think, inspiring sort of a different like notice of sustainability at the high school. So being mindful about trash pickup, um, and I think that more students are kind of becoming involved in that effort as well as kind of different sustainability efforts. Um, so those are the major things that we kind of talked about with sustainability. And um, if there's anything else that you would like us to like look into or cover, we'd be more than happy to do so. Um, and then on the Senate side, sorry, this is a bit of a longer update today, um, but we just finished our spirit week. So that included powder puff, which is a flag football game. That's a tradition at the high school. We had a dodgeball tournament with I believe over 300 students came to. So that's quite a significant number. That's about one in four students at the high school. Um, and that was, that went really well. Um, and there are different spirit activities throughout the week. And overall it's been a, it was a very successful spirit week leading up to Thanksgiving break. 
Um, yeah, thank you. I, I want to thank you for and Harry for for keeping sustainability on your radar and helping us keep it on our mm -hmm. radar. Um, and I, I would hope you and Harry, when you choose, uh, bring us up to date again when you think there's information that's good or bad or indifferent uh, ideas yeah. about resources you need. I hope you'll uh, not only bring it Mr. Mastrulo's way, but our way as well. Thank yeah. You yeah, we would definitely love to do that. And um, we sort of have been talking at um, the Senate level as well about different sustainability efforts. And if there's ever a club or anything that you'd be interested in coming on and talking about, such as trash trucks, um, we'd be more than happy to kind of facilitate that. Great. Thank you for your report. Very thorough. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Darcy. We'll thank see, you, Darcy. We'll see Harry next week. The next time, yeah, well, next week, yeah, actually, <laughs> next week. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, so we have public comment now. If uh, you are in the public and you would like to share thoughts or questions with us, uh, now is the time to raise your hand using the participants tab. I am not seeing any raised hands. Okay, so we go to recognitions. Naomi, hi, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I have to get those earphones in. Um, could I ask Kenlyn and Savon and Kristen to turn their cameras on as well. Is that okay? Yes, please, please. please. Great. Hi, guys. Um, so we are here to talk a little bit about the work of Mecco Family Friends. Um, and I will sort of start us off and share a little bit about why I am really glad that um, you guys have chosen to recognize their work tonight um, and then see if any if they have anything that they want to add. But um, so Meco Family Friends is not a new organization. Um, uh, it's a partnership between families uh, and staff members. Um, and its uh, goal is to really make connections between our Boston families and our Concord families. Um, like so many things in the last couple of years, it has sort of been uh, hibernating during the pandemic. Um, and so this year, finally, it's sort of been re, uh, reinvigorated. Um, and what I think has been really nice, or at least what I have really appreciated about the work this year, um, is that in addition to just being really glad that it's back and planning um, activities and events and ways to connect um, and build relationships and partnerships between our Concord families and our Boston families. Um, but this year there seems to be a really um, concerted effort and, and a, a, a focus um, to really bring some of those events and, and um, to, to bring that partnership into Boston. So in the past, I think Meco Family Friends did a great job of connecting families. And I'm sorry, I have I, I am in my kitchen because if I am not with the cats, they're gonna knock the menorah over and burn my house down, but it is causing <laughs> some technical, <laughs> technical problems here. Um, so I'm sorry, my camera keeps moving. Um, so, but this year there's been a really, really concerted effort on um, not only developing that partnership and connection, um, but really bringing it into Boston. And so um, the, the first event that we had, I think it was really fitting that the first event we had in 20 months um, of the Mecco Family Friends Program actually took place at Franklin Park. And that one of the um, next events, which is I think gonna be a big one, um, is an event taking place at the Frog Pond in Boston. And that that's really sort of a different and a departure from activities in the past, which have uh, included, uh, you know, apple picking and other things in the Concord area. Um, but it's, I think it's just, um, it's, it's just recognition that this partnership goes both ways and that it's um, an attempt to really make that bridge uh, go in both directions. Um, and so I think that that's one of the reasons that we um, are recognizing the work right now. Um, and I, 
in particular, I just want to say that the event in the fall, which was really widely attended, would not have been possible um, without Kenlyn, Kristen, and Savon's tireless effort in making it possible. So thank you to the three of you. Um, I don't know if either any of you would like to add anything um, about the work that you guys are doing, but I know, um, I mean, I can speak for Alcott, but I know that Alcott greatly appreciates it. So thank you very much. Sure, I'll briefly add, hello everyone, I'm Savan, I'm the new METCO um, liaison at Alcott. Um, and <laughs> I mean, I think Naomi did a great job of covering that. Um, but yeah, just to really emphasize, I think um, the point in connecting the Concord families to Boston as well, I think that was something that was really important and we got great feedback on that event. Um, and so we're looking forward to doing the Frog Pond event that we're trying to plan for February, but I have to give a big thanks to Kristen and Kenlyn and also Tanika, um, who wasn't here, but she was part of the team as well, who were really just like pushing it and saying like, we're going to do it and we got it done. So thank you so much to all of you as well. Yeah, I, I would add something, but Kenlyn, do you have time to unmute? I do have time to unmute. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I think Ms. Krako nailed it on the money that this program pretty much, I don't want to say always existed, but it, it's been there for quite some time now. And the only difference is that um, we're bringing Concord to Boston versus Boston always going to Concord. And that is the highlight of everything, um, seeing Concord families in Boston, in my city, taking the drive that my son does every day. Um, so it was it was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and and I would add, I'm I'm Kristen. I'm one of the parents at at Alcott also, and I've been kind of learning about the Metco Family Friends Program for the last five years as as my son's gone through the program. But this is the first year that we've had um, much more investment from Boston families. Not not investment, but Kenlyn was able to step up, and she does not have a lot of extra time to put this event together. and But having the perspective and the leadership of a Boston family, I think was much more informative than a Concord family saying, hey, I think Boston families might like that. And so hopefully kind of this is the beginning of um, Boston families kind of feeling a larger part of our community and, and being invited um, purposefully to say, you know, what is it that would make you feel more part of our community? And then we also kind of have, I think, bigger, bigger plans for developing more meaningful and long lasting relationships that hopefully last over the time that all the kids are together. And I think a big part of that is supporting the Metco staff. You know, we've got this uh, new director, Heidi, which has been very supportive of kind of our ideas. But Savon, this is your first year at Alcott and you just jumped right in. And I think you have some really important ideas that I hope that, um, you know, at Alcott, but also at the at the district level, are heard in terms of how um, both METCO staff, but also um, all of the school staff can better support our students from Boston. So, you know, look forward to kind of hearing more ideas that we have about um, attending Black Nativity in, in uh, Boston and kind of talking about it or, you know, going to events in, in Boston or taking the bus through neighborhoods to kind of see where kids live and things like that. So we're gonna try to do kind of more meaningful things to bring, um, more uh, acknowledgement or uh, understanding into the lives of you know Concord families, um, but also allow Concord families to kind of show that we value you know our families from Boston who spend the days every day coming out there. That you know we can put our sports on hold um, to make those relationships and, and go to Boston on a weekend. And, and so it was really great to kind of see um, in, in both ways you know families making that extra effort and, and showing what's important. So. Hopefully, you know, the school board and, and the district keeps investing in kind of meaningful activities and, um, you know, as, as Metco staff and, and other folks kind of suggest some ideas. So thank you. And also to our Alcott PTG, who, you know, certainly put their money where their mouth is to kind of support it and make it feel like a, a well-funded event, not just an afterthought. So thanks to everybody who was involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Savon, Chris, and Kenlyn. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. I mean, I know that everybody's feeling very pulled, very stressed for time. Uh, energy is hard to harness. And so this is really commendable what you guys have managed to do already um, this year. And very much looking forward to, um, to everything that you have um, going forward. Yep. 
So keep us uh, informed. Yep. <laughs> yep. Please. And yep. I mean, this is, you know, we're always here. If they're a place to publicize events or, or talk about events or highlight events or, or, um, just pop in and say hi like these this was a success or this you know this is something we need to work on we're, yep we're always uh always listening this yeah. is very encouraging especially as we try mm -hmm. so hard to come out of this uh, period of social isolation um you seem to be remedying a great deal of that in a very significant way yep thank you thank you so much thanks All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Naomi, too, for coming, mm -hmm. for bringing everyone together tonight. Um, OK, we have reading of the minutes from open session of uh, October 26th and November 9th. A motion to accept the minutes. So moved. A uh, second for both. Discussion? Nope. Thank okay. you very much for the minutes. Okay, roll call. Anderson, I for both. Ruth, I for both. Marana, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Rainy, I for both. Wilson for region. Okay, uh, correspondence. Um, on the region side, we had um, a communication for our student reps. And um, <clears throat> I think that's it. Yeah. Is there one other one was other time on learning time on learning yes. thank you we got back to her yesterday with the worksheet thanks to mr mistrew and concord school committee had a number of uh communications on the middle school and a communication on the mass policy okay um and a communication i'm sorry on facilities what on facilities, facilities. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, chairs and liaisons reports. Tracy. Okay. So DEI, we had a meeting last month or this month, I should say. I don't know. It's the end of November, so it's hard <laughs> to say. <laughs> we have another meeting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, we are meeting on Zoom. We encourage anyone in the public to come and meet with us. Uh, we have taken a collaborative approach to building our agendas, and hopefully everybody feels part of that. And I think that all of you got an email from me today with some homework from Andrew that I've sent along for tomorrow if you're attending and if you're not that's totally fine did you have a question yeah yes in that email it said there will be questions that seemed like they were going to be attached they were within the body of the email I think but there were three questions were I think you had to pick out a quote something like that all right I'll look at it yeah, again there, all right I think it's within the email you might have just expand the email all right I'll look again you have to look through you have to read down into andrews to andrews not yes, into the forwarded message yeah i'm guilty also okay the no read aloud I, am, I am not this. an expert in gmail but this. uh read aloud it's level two yes so yeah so that's any sentence is. yes from the article or like from the article okay from the article one that resonates with you. Okay, a sentence that resonates with you from got the it article. great perfect so you can Genius. go home tonight and do your homework oh, okay great um we had a great discussion i thought at the last meeting and lots of questions and paula was with us andrew was with us andrew gave us an update as to his work the equity surveys are um have been completed and then the only question out there is if we're going to do a separate equity survey as a school committee because some of us have done it as parents and I think Andrew was going to send the survey along, but he was just going to get some guidance from Dr. Warnham and Dr. Blake on that. And then we will be having some focus groups and we'll have to split up to three and three so we don't violate open meeting law. So those are coming in December. And as I said, tomorrow with the article, some discussion and on the agenda is also school committee training that will probably happen maybe in January. We're still trying to figure out the direction we're moving in on that. Okay, good. That's it. That sounds good. And we, sh it, 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 since the space is limited in the other focus groups, we since we have our own focus group, we should into our into the school. We committee. should go to ours. But if if it applies to you and you're a parent and you want to attend one of those, you can attend one of those. Like if if the groups speak to you in that way, you can do that also. 
All right. And I think I also forwarded all of his Zoom, not all the Zoom links, but the dates for all of those. <clears throat> Thank you. Alexa. Sure. Uh, a few weeks ago, I think on Monday the 15th, uh, the CPAC board had their monthly meeting, and we were really fortunate to have Deb Dixon give a comparable presentation to the one that she gave us um the like the meeting prior our prior school committee meeting i think mm -hmm. um and it was actually a really well attended board meeting and i think that deb's presentation was very well received um there was great q a and again i think that it is very clear the investment that the district is making in special education. I think parents are becoming, I don't know, more abreast of what's going on. I think, you know, we forget how bizarre 2020 and some of 2021 school year was. I think that um, it was just harder to communicate about anything other than COVID. So to then have this presentation where people could really see quite how much the needle has moved in these specific areas um, because everyone knows about their own child's needle and how much that is moving but it's really it was really really spectacular to see that from a district level for this group um, and i think they've got some new leadership that even was voted into the meeting uh, or into their team at the last meeting so um, we're we're really looking forward to just refining that collaboration and I think the work is, is moving. Eva, you have anything to add? Yes, hi, I have uh, uh, just on the region side from that meeting, uh, there was a call out uh, to our families in Carlisle to uh, join and participate in, uh, in, in bigger um, uh, engagement um, that uh, uh, at those meetings, uh, they are looking um, uh, Concord Carlisle Regional uh, uh, CPAC group is looking for connection with our Carlisle uh, families and the Carlisle CPAC. So um, uh, I, I, we are uh, pushing that message to our families in Carlisle. It's a very young board. I, and not, I don't know the ages of these ladies, but their children and whatnot are, seem to be predominantly elementary. So that makes a lot of sense, Eva. There's they know that they need some voices there. And it's essentially a brand new board also. Yes, mm -hmm. totally. A lot of families, elementary and middle school, not many families on the, uh, from the high school. So they're really looking for engagement. Um, so we'll keep that message uh, going to Carlisle as well. A lot of energy, which was really refreshing to see. Thank you. Thank you, building. You want to do? Uh, Should we do the building and the conversation? Yeah, yeah. good point. <laughs> we do this every time. <laughs> yeah, I do, don't I? Uh, so uh, we last met here on the ninth. Uh, since then, on the fifteenth, we joined the select board, as did many other committees. Not all could attend, and uh, gave uh, brief updates uh, pertinent to the Envision Concord document and uh, initiative um, and the policy subcommittee met on the 19th and we devoted the entire meeting to facilities and fees and there's more work to be done with uh, meetings with admin tomorrow and meetings with the policy subcommittee maybe next week the 8th next week the 8th mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Hunter and I met with Sue Curtin today. Uh, she represents the Nanai Committee. Yeah. And uh, we have a request from our Nanai Connections for information about the Concord and Carlisle schools uh, so that they can inform their own children about uh, life here in, in our schools. Great. We're starting to work on that. Yeah, I just add to that that Sue's been meeting regularly with Mike Mistrullo. He's on Excellent. the so we're keeping that relationship alive. alive through COVID. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> That's good news. That's it. That's it. Great. That's a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so on to discussion.
COVID updates. Great. So I put together some of our most recent data as we usually take a look. Um, I did this this morning and we've had one case since then. So I put the time on it because I didn't have time to change everything. Mm -hmm. um, just a reminder, the mask mandate is in place. We are adhering to the commissioner's order for masks through January 15th. Um, so that'll be an ongoing discussion, I expect, as we go through December and January. Uh, COVID cases, it's worth noting some of our patterns changing significantly here, uh, which is not a conquered anomaly by any stretch, but we have definitely seen a substantial uptick the last three weeks, I would say, starting that week of the 14th, where you'll see we had a lot of cases happening. I'm gonna just call Thoreau out specifically because we have had a spike at Thoreau that thankfully looks like it's waned off over the last five days or so. So we're grateful for that. Um, over the course of 10, nine days, we had 13 cases, a couple more followed that while we were on the break. Um, they were spread across eight classrooms with as many as three cases in uh, two classrooms. So we were just kept watching all of that very carefully, stayed in continuous contact with our local health officials, as well as DPH and DESE. Um, I think it's important to say out loud, the message we're hearing from the state level organizations is three in a classroom is sort of their threshold for more concern. If you go over three, that's when they're gonna start talking about what we're gonna do. Yes. Um, with a lot of reservation about sending anybody home remote. Mm -hmm. So, and at most it would be a week with the seven day quarantine, which you might already be part way into. So the interesting part of test and stay is every time you get a new positive, you reset the seven days. So it's an interesting uh, dynamic that we're just getting accustomed to, but uh, Desi was very supportive of what we've been doing as was DPH. Essentially the message was stay the course and stay in touch. We felt very well supported. Um, and grateful that it's waning. So I think good news there, a lot of, some of those cases were, te were off of the pool testing that we found, and then some of them were off of test and stay, and then a mix of everything else with symptomatic and close contacts from home and et cetera. So um, there isn't any one thing that happened there. That's really good news in many ways. Um, do we think there might've been some school transmission, which we're gonna just carefully say, we don't know for sure, but we did have, multiple cases in a room that were coming up on our testing. So it was a, a good learning experience for us. We maintained educational service through all of it. That's the goal this year is to, to be able to weather it and um, manage it at the same time. So um, overall, we're up to 63 cases. I think that's almost double what I brought to three weeks ago. So it's worth stating how significant it's changed. Um, and then testing participation, this is the week, the full week before Thanksgiving. It's very consistent week to week. Um, we are glad to get that back in place this week. We didn't test last week with the short week and the state's directive. Um, test and stay, this is just sort of, this is what the numbers start to look like with us um, doing the antigens in school. It's a lot to manage. I won't say that it isn't. We've had a lot of help. CIC sends people on site. We're benefiting from that. We also have a couple floater nurses who move around depending where we need them. Um, but it's a lot of logistics. And by the time you're testing eight classrooms in a given morning, that's a pretty pretty substantial <laughs> process for sure. Um, Desi's didn't publish much on paper, but we did meet with the commissioner right before Thanksgiving. Um, they named to expect spikes, just like we were experiencing at the time it happened, um, and said their gradual process will be to look at within a classroom, and then if potentially a grade level seems to be having some sort of spike, they would look at that. Never mentioned closing schools entirely. In fact, I feel like we were getting a pretty our directive to not necessarily do what some of others have done ahead of us um, and an absolute directive to be on the phone with them as you're making decisions. So um, I personally lean into that because I'm finding I get a lot of support when I make that phone call. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I would hope that will, that will be continue to be our way of managing. 
Um, just while we're on remote and the weather's turned into the wintry stuff here, um, there's no word on remote options for snow days, just like there hasn't been for heat or any other things that have happened as of the last six months or so, really since we fully reopened school in April statewide. So it is traditional snow days as of the moment, and that'll be the way we operate unless the state gives us other options, which I'll come back to you with and we'll talk through. So, so that's it. Traditional snow days are back, everybody. And then uh, just our, the really successful pediatric vaccination clinics that happened at Alcott in November. The second round of that is um, starting tomorrow at the high school. And then the 13th is the follow-up. And we think we've got that all in place. And just really grateful <clears throat> for the real ease that this vendor has and the way they operate are just pretty fluid. So people have been like over the moon about nice, yeah. even just little things like how exceptional each individual nurse is there and just yeah. how they have treated the kids. I mean, I've countless. That's excellent. More than, you know, that is excellent. Mm -hmm. people coming in and getting offered their boosters uh, has been a sort of, <laughs> I don't know if I should advertise that, but it's been like parents being like, oh my God, and I got my booster. Um, so it yeah, has been, great. the vendors just been like, you, like they're just so easy. It's like they have been a pleasure yeah. to work with. I mean, Thank we've you. had little bits of need at times if the appointments fill up, and I'm, you know, on the on the horn saying, "Please open it up more." And they they do, and yeah. really a well oiled machine and great with the community. So yeah, wonderful. I'll be sure to pass that along. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it is like it's, yeah, it's it's wild. Yeah, It'd be nice to hear. Do you have numbers as to how many um, kids were vaccinated at those clinics? Uh, we totaled 740 the first night and just over 600 the second night. So over 1,300 kids. And will we get an update as we did for the middle school and the high school, you know, with the percentage vaccinated? Definitely. So the nurses are geared up to start collecting the vaccinations once the kids are fully vaccinated. So that'll happen in the next few weeks of December and into January. So we'll bring you those numbers as they they go to the evolve. state system. They should they, they'll also go to the state system. And usually the numbers I bring you are a combination of what parents report mm -hmm. to us and they double yep. check in the state system. And between the two we get a real thorough thorough look. And I guess one thing that's ever changing with test and stay that we didn't really think about when we were coming up with our policies was now that we're going to have a lot of vaccinated kids, so they will no longer participate in test and study. So when I tell you how many, vaccinated? how much logistically this is to manage, yes. the yeah. relief I was offering last week was once these kids are fully vaccinated, you don't have to test, test and stay and them. Yeah. Um, because we're, you saw the numbers, we've done none at the high school and maybe yeah. three mm -hmm. at the middle school, because yeah. one case might, might give you a couple of people to test and stay. So it does, it will change dramatically. Yeah. Right. given the expected mm -hmm. high percentage of well and it's so interesting kids. like when i look at your presentation to me really it's a story about vaccination it is yeah. there are no out you know we are not seeing really anything worthwhile to know at the high school agreed. and sanborn um totally agreed spectacular yeah. <laughs> we don't just we what test 10 to 15 percent of the students at the high school at the high school you tested 80 kids yeah. before the break which is yeah. not even yeah, but yeah. kids are not going home sick and neither no, no, no. are adults, you know, there's no. doesn't seem to be pervasive. No, I agree with you there. and with all the variant yeah. talk and all the things that keep evolving around us, I think we're living data that shows the vaccinations are working. And, and I think actually Massachusetts came out with today that of vaccinated, the breakthrough percentage seems to be settling at like 1.67%. That is what Tricia McKeon keeps saying yeah. to me and at first it felt higher, but now it's yeah, so the official Massachusetts that. state data has yeah. come out on that. So that's a lot RJ. of good news. Yeah, right. that's yeah. a lot of good news. We hope that eventually the 12 to 17 year olds can get boosted. Yes, mm -hmm. it will. It'll come. Yeah, yeah. Just, I think they're trying to figure out the dosages and all the. Yeah. Good. So, kind of predicted, we thought this was probably what was going to happen. happen. I think that's okay and helped us to. As it happened, go, oh, this is what we thought could happen. <laughs> so. And I just wanted to ask, we're still uh, doing uh, the, uh, we're still asking parents to fill out the screener in case the kids have 
symptoms, correct? Yeah, just for symptoms. Yeah. Just for symptoms. Just for symptoms. Yes. And I do think even at the high school level, I think kids are testing because there's a there are a lot of colds going around. There's a lot of yes. flu going around. And you pretty much you have to test. And right. even at the college level, there are flu outbreaks right now. And yeah. so kids have other things besides COVID. That's correct. So no. they might not be in pool testing, but they're they are testing, testing if outside they're of school. That yes. is a good point. Good. That's great. Yeah. Like my entire bathroom is overrun by by next testing. Test. So I just buy them. You can't get them, so I just scoop them up everywhere I go. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's bad. Maybe I'm hoarding them. I don't know. Just so I'm clear, we aren't accepting the at-home test yet. No, I just no. mean for me before I go see a girlfriend. I'm like, you get invited to a like a yeah, no, lunch, handy. and you're like, eh, okay. Yeah, I think that's where we're all going to be eventually. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. You did it as a family for Thanksgiving. I mean, it's like before we see parents, oh, yeah. like everybody buy next, and let's just move on. Yeah. So thank you. Great. Great. All right. Challenge success. Um, stay with. Justin? Sure. Justin and Mike are both on, yep. so we'll invite them to turn their cameras on. They've both given you highlights um, on a small slide deck. You've had access to the full data report. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll invite you to turn it over to them and then we can just have a conversation. Great. Welcome, Justin. Welcome, Mike. Hi, good evening. All right, so uh, who's first, Mr. Cameron, me or you, sir? Doesn't matter to me. All right, go get him. <laughs> I knew he was going to do that. You first. All right, go Mr. Get Cameron. Him. Go get him. Uh -uh. Okay, um, are we going to share screen share of the slides? Yes. Aaron, can you pull them up? <clears throat> Hold on, I'll do it. This is the trick of Zoom. I'm used to her being able to take cues from me when she's in the room. <laughs> yeah, Laurie, for some reason, I can't screen share. Oh, okay, I can, no problem. Okay. Just had to get to it. All right, Mr. Cameron, you're on. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, we've had a chance to come together as a challenge success team. Um, in total, I want to say, um, and I felt like one of these slides, maybe the second slide, Lori, shares um, the team members. Yep, there they are. Um, so we are about 15 or so. Um, we have a collection of students, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, um, including one 8th grader who is a representative of student council. Um, then we have five parents and we have about seven staff. Um, that number of staff actually has dropped a couple. So I think we're about five or so. Um, in terms of the parents and the staff, um, there's probably about three or four of us um, who have been with Challenge Success um, since the genesis of Challenge Success at the middle school, which was, um, I believe, 2017, 2018. Uh, the school year 2016, 2017, the district engaged in challenge success um, in an effort to survey the students in spring of 2017. The first formal year of challenge success at the middle school uh, was my first year. And again, that was school year 2017 and 18. Uh, if you scroll back up, I just wanted to mention again the team members. Um, but these two slides represent uh, the two things that we wanted to report to the school committee. Um, the first of which was a survey that challenged success, uh, thanks to the kindness um, and support of the Concord Ed Fund. Um, here are some statistics and a data presentation that was done um, at the either September or October challenge success meeting. Um, we do have a challenge success coach and consultant. His name is Paul. Um, and he was able to do about a 40 minute presentation with us. Um, and here's some of the highlights that were a part of the minutes of this challenge success meeting. 
Um, so three words that the students in spring of 2021, and uh, I would just preface the fact that we were in a pandemic and the students took this um, coming off of a hybrid um, or in a hybrid school year. Um, so kids were really um, in a classroom, desks were in rows. Um, it was very teacher centered instruction. Uh, there wasn't really much project-based learning happening, uh, much group work happening. Uh, so we really feel it's an opportunity for a new baseline for the middle school. Um, and we're really excited as a Challenge Success team to um, survey our students in a year or two uh, to really measure the growth. But here are some of the statistics that were presented to the Challenge Success team um, at our Challenge Success meeting uh, about a month or two months ago. So three words that our students of last year used to describe our school, uh, fun, caring, uh, welcoming, um, and a word that trends uh, throughout the research of challenge success um, and how students will describe school. Um, and that word unfortunately is boring. Um, students are getting an average of about 7.7 .7 hours of sleep, um, which is pretty much where they were just a few years ago. Um, when Challenge Success surveyed um, the middle school students again in spring of 2017. So this is an area where our partnership with families, um, we really haven't seen a lot of growth. Um, and there's so much research behind the importance of sleep um, and how that can lead to a more successful student in all facets. Um, so here's a statistic that has increased dramatically since um, our implementation of our advisory program called Home Base. Because when students were surveyed in spring of 2017, we did not have advisory in place. Um, and one of the many reasons why um, we were using research-based um, decisions to put forward an advisory program was to make sure that our students felt connected to our adults and to align with the research that states that if students feel like they have even just one adult at their school, they're gonna feel safer um, in going to that school. So 72% of the middle school students felt like they had an, an adult that they can go to. Um, and that was dramatically up since 2017 and trends much higher um, than regional, regional and national averages. Uh, the workload um, and students feeling overburdened and stressed about homework also um, were some marked improvements. Uh, in 2017, 59% of our students felt like they had too much homework um, and only about 30% said they had the right amount. Um, in this past spring, um, and understand something, a lot of the students this past spring were doing their classwork because of the hybrid model at home. So we fully expected to not really see much growth on this data point, um, but we saw a tremendous amount of growth. 32% um, of the students said that they felt they had too much homework and 65% uh, felt they had just about the right amount. Um, here's another, here's a data point um, that we have, we have essentially made our charge. And I'm gonna talk about that in an action plan on the next slide in just a couple minutes. Um, we still are pretty much um, at the place we were in spring of 2017 in a statistic regarding um, engagement. 42% of our students this past spring felt like they were just doing school um, and they weren't authentically engaged. Um, they weren't um, highly curious. They weren't highly motivated. Even if they were doing well, they weren't defining themselves as engaged. Again, I have to restate, this was a survey done in a pandemic and during a hybrid model. Um, only 18% of our students this past spring felt like they were fully engaged. Um, and we really had an opportunity to synthesize this data, um, unpack it, and I'm gonna share with you an action plan in just a couple more, couple minutes. Uh, to reduce stress, students said, um, they felt like there was still some work to do with reducing the homework load, um, creating time for homework in classes, creating time for projects in classes, 
Um, I think parents' uh, voices really echoed that. Um, and the students were very clear um, on the work that we've done as a district of including more diverse voices and hiring diversity, um, but they felt like we could do more in that area as well. So transitioning over to the second slide um, and the action plan of the challenge success team of our students, parents, and teachers. Um, we did this past, um, our very last meeting, we talked about all the things that we have accomplished as a school and a district uh, regarding challenge success. Uh, some of those um, highlights include homework free weekends um, that parallel that work being done up at the high school. Uh, student shadow day that I wanna talk about in just a couple minutes. Um, open session with faculty, um, which has really been a big part of our advisory program as well. Uh, parent coffees, unplug nights, um, parents really getting the message out to challenge success um, and the mission is really about engagement um, in talking about a well-balanced child um, and defining and how our community defines what success is. Um, we have gone forward in some policy changes. Um, one of the example of policy changes that went forward um, to school council and school committee a few years ago was um, in the team model of a teaming middle school, making sure that the teachers came together to have academic discussions about not overtaxing and overstressing our students. An example of a policy that was drafted and accepted was no more than two major assessments, um, major projects or tests or quizzes on any given night. Um, and again, home base um, was a big part of the first data um, that was dropped upon us um, in spring of 2017. Finally, um, we can't at all, um, you know, not acknowledge the work that has been done in our master schedule. Um, we went from, well, actually, let me start in this place. The student shadow day was an opportunity three years ago where 14 Concord Middle School faculty and staff uh, spent a day with a student volunteer. Um, we spent our whole day, some of us actually started at the bus stop um, and ended at the bus stop. Um, but I would say about nine or 10 started at the first bell and ended at the last bell. Um, that informed a lot of transformational decisions in our master schedule. At that time, when we did the student shadow day, we did not have transition time between our classes. Um, and many of us, I was one of the adults who shadowed a student, I shadowed a sixth grader. Um, we felt that when the bell rang, because there was no transition time, um, we were caught up in, you know, almost like a rat race, like, you know, the greatest race and trying to get to the next class. And it just contributed to this frenzied, very stressful pace. Uh, we went from no transition time to having five minutes of transition, transition time last year during the pandemic uh, to now having four minutes of transition time. Um, we went from having no snack um, and recess in the morning uh, to having snack and recess now in the morning. Um, we went from advisory being about six minutes to last year being 15 um, to bringing it to 10 minutes this year. Um, all of these things were actually um, validated with a survey that the middle school did upon the students of last year when we asked them, what would you like to pack up from the master schedule that we had in place during the pandemic and take with you um, as the pandemic we thought um, this past spring was lifting. Um, and we heard students when they said that they wanted a longer transition time, they wanted to preserve that recess and snack break in the morning, they wanted a longer home base and advisory block, and they wanted us to preserve um, as much as of the recess time after lunch. And we've done that as well. Um, moving forward, I'll just close with um, the, where we are as a challenge success team is um, we've actually brought together a working group um, from this team. There's about six of us, a um, couple parents, couple um, faculty and staff and one student um, who is looking to move forward with doing the student shadow day again. 
uh, to allow us um, as a faculty and staff um, about four years later to um, just go ahead with what was such an important, valuable experience. Um, that shadow day about three years ago landed in a place where we did a forum where we invited all our parents uh, to attend. Um, and we're looking to do something very similar this year that might be in a hybrid way. Um, and essentially each faculty and staff who shadowed a student sat next to the student that they shadowed. And we just shared out our experiences um, and shared out um, you know, about how enlightening it was for the staff uh, to really have a better understanding of the student's day at the middle school. Questions? Uh, was I on mute the whole time? Exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I, we're, I... we're pondering uh, engagement and some of, some of the other items. I, I think this is very helpful. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I totally forgot to mention the engagement piece. Um, thank you, Court. So um, the engagement piece, um, really, we all looked at each other um, and we really talked about whether or not it was the challenge success team that should be tackling engagement. Um, and what we decided to do in September um, is actually take that charge and bring it to the teaching and learning team, uh, the team that consists of all my department chairs. Um, and essentially, um, we meet as a teaching and learning team every month. Um, and for the past four or five years since I've been in district, that agenda is pretty much driven by all of these, um, you know, agenda items that, you know, um, the department chairs might have and might want to discuss questions that they have. We've decided to treat every department chair meeting, every teaching and learning meeting as a professional learning community, solely focused on the topic of engagement. Um, and that is a charge that the teaching and learning team and all the department chairs at Concord Middle School has taken on. We're doing nothing but meeting for 90 minutes a month on the topic of engagement. Um, and I think this group knows this, but all of the department chairs at Concord Middle School are instructional coaches. And what they're taking from this per professional learning community is they're going back and doing observations with the teachers in their department, and they're having coaching discussions um, with members of their um, department. So the engagement piece has been brought over um, to the department chairs at the Concord Middle School. Great. <clears throat> so uh, just my observation that I think you pointed out some areas of real success, which was, which are home base, um, putting in snack and recess and putting in passing time. Those all seem like Oh, that's such a big deal, but I know it is, uh, it can make a huge difference in a student's life, <laughs> just having those little bits of space in their schedule where they can sort of reset, um, take a break, um, do what they want to do for a little bit of time. And uh, I just think that makes a big difference in their day. Because as you observe, just running from class to class with no breaks, especially if you're a sixth grader, that's a dramatic change in your life um, and probably not the right time to make that dramatic change. So I think that, um, you know, we have to take this with a grain of salt, as you said, because this is, survey was done during COVID, um, but I think you're seeing a lot of the positive uh, strides that you've made with putting those changes into place. And it sounds like you're fully committed to keeping them um, as part of the schedule. So I think that's great. Thank you. Welcome. And, you know, in parallel to the challenge success survey, again, was a survey that I put together um, that was just a little bit more focused on practices at Concord Middle School, such as, you know, we had a 10 minute mass break recess snack during um, the pandemic year. Is that something that if we're able to hold on to in future years, 
um, and the students were overwhelmingly in support um, of that, of the longer advisory home base um, and in um, the transition time as well. Great. And I guess from my perspective, I mean, I would guess that if you were to do the survey now, kids would be much more engaged than they were in the spring. Yep. You know, I think that some of us have lived with very unengaged middle schoolers and high schoolers for the past 18 months. Um, you know, but I think what's important is 72% of the students felt like they had an adult that they could go in the building, which I think is probably the most important part of the survey, especially in the middle school population. And that, you know, something that kind of frustrates me is some of this, you know, the school has no control over sleep patterns. The school has no control over how many activities or sports kids are playing and why they might be having too much homework. So that piece is not really in here is they might think they have too much homework, but do they think they have too much homework because they're playing five sports in a season? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always kind of take it with a little grain of salt, but I do think that the takeaway is having, you know, kids engage with adults is probably the most important thing during these years. Here. Can I ask? Hey, yep. Yeah. I, one of the questions I had, Justin, I noticed that um, it seemed like a, a, a metric that moved quite a bit was um, the kids' perception of their workload, you know, being either too much or just enough. And um, it seemed like there were more kids in 2021 that thought um, the homework was just about right. Um, it seemed like that kind of flipped. Was that the result of something you guys? conscientiously did at the middle school with respect to homework and if that was the case i'm just curious like is that individual teacher driven is it grade driven is it team driven is it like subject driven and like do those little different groups reach consensus on workload or does it sort of just happen organically or did it not happen at all and kids just change their minds Yep, uh, great question. So it used to be department driven, um, but we are making that shift to make sure it is grade and team driven. Um, and that the sixth graders, um, you know, each, each grade has three teams and each sixth grade team should be in parallel to what is actually the more important conversation. And that's not so much reducing homework, it's making sure or that it's um, the homework that's being assigned is not busy work and it's authentic and it's truly engaging. Um, and it's not leaving behind the important um, piece of research that says, you know, students need feedback. So how do we harness technology um, in giving homework that offers up feedback pretty much immediately to the students? Um, because that piece is sometimes lost with homework as well. Um, so I, I think it's a conscious effort um, to really take the conversation from the department level to the team level, um, and then understand the empowerment that happens. Because if a sixth grade social studies teacher is having a discussion about homework in the, sixth, in the social studies department, where eighth grade uh, social studies teachers, let's pretend, are dominating the conversation, um, then they may feel a bit muted. So now that conversation is picked up and it's brought over to the team level. And all sixth grade teachers, for the most part, are like-minded in, in, in a uh, context of not overwhelming the students. Um, so I think that shift, and it's very much how we're building the new middle school, that shift is a very conscious shift uh, that has moved the needle on this. Great, thanks. Anybody else? Oh. All right, Justin, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all. All right, I guess, that, I guess that means I'm off. All right, well, thank you. Appreciate the, uh, the time to talk a little bit about challenge success and about the school. Um, you know, just a little context too. So this was the, the uh, survey was taken in June of 2000 um, of last year. And I, I do think it's fair to say that, you know, it wasn't a pandemic. So we do have to take it with a grain of salt. I don't think that means we dismiss everything, but I do think it makes it just more complicated how we translate and analyze it. Um, because even for the, from the student perspective, 
what was their mindset as they were taking it? Were they were they thinking of, um, of it like during as the, as the hybrid model? They were all back in school at this point. Was it from that perspective? You know, so I, I do think we have to be, you know, be careful um, about how much we interpret uh, the data here and, and, and what we do with it. But nevertheless, it is useful. And there's some there's some really good nuggets in there for us to 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 move forward. Um, so just starting with the with the first one here. Uh, well, back up one more. Uh, so it was 1,071 uh, 1,071 students uh, took the survey as well. So it was a really good sample. Um, so if you look at this data and what we learned from our coach is the fact that fun is even in the equation is really unique um, to Concord, which I found to be, um, you know, just really heartening, heartwarming. Um, uh, and John Kleiman, who was the gentleman who presented the data, just said you don't typically see that. Not surprised that we saw it as stressful as um, also not only an increase, uh, uh, but also just um, very prevalent. Uh, you know, really happy to see caring, uh, and you know, competitive. There is a decline in competitiveness, which which I think is uh, is a positive. A few others that you know didn't make this um, uh, this slide, but um, that were very prevalent are friendly, supportive, inclusive, academic, uh, and other. And there was also um, a boring one as well, which is pretty typical, as as, uh, as Justin pointed out. Uh, so if we go to the the second slide. And just so um, a little context about the survey in general, it's broken down into um, a bunch of different areas. And so it's health and stress, it's sleep, it's academic integ integrity, supported school, engagement, extracurriculars, parental expectations, homework, uh, et cetera. There's a few others. So just highlighting um, some of the bigger points from some of the subgroups here and under health and stress. So 73% of the students reported always feeling pressure to do well in school. 64% reporting that they often worry about taking assessments. 69% reported grades and assessments cause stress. Uh, and so you can see that academics are stressful. And I think some of that is, is normal and healthy, um, but obviously we don't want it overwhelming students uh, either. 46% did report stress from lack of sleep. Our students are not getting sufficient amount of sleep. It's no surprise. I also have teenagers and I witness it myself. They're getting, our average is under seven hours. They're supposed to get nine. Uh, and you know what? I think we've seen uh, progress in this area uh, with the late start. And so it's, it's a good thing, uh, but the kids are going to bed 11 or later. I think that is just part of their natural rhythm and, they're, and they are busy. Uh, I would love to see them get more sleep, including my own. Uh, my own children, um, but uh, you know, it kind of is a product of the situation. I will say that a lot of kids, if you look, if you drill down on some of the data, you see that the kids do have their phone in their in the bedroom. Uh, I don't pass judgment. I'm just saying I, I do think that was that is probably causing some of the students to stay up later than they would like. Uh, in any anyway, event, moving on to some of the other um, health and stress indicators here: 59% reported stress from the workload. 65% reported that they often are always worried about not doing well in school. 38% reported stress for mental health issues and 82% reported that college and future plans cause stress. That is, that there was an increase. Um, and there is really isn't a surprise there. I think the pandemic definitely exacerbated that issue. There was a lot of students that were accepted the previous year that decided to do a gap year and then enroll the following year. I think there's a little bit of a backlog. So I think it was natural just for that to be really stressful. Uh, and lastly, college again, um, weighing heavily on students with 63% often are always worried about getting into the college of their choice. Next slide. So percentage of students who missed school last month due to health or emotional problems, we see a drastic decline here. And I will say it's, it's uh, very comforting to see that, however, this is definitely one I feel like we do have to take with a grain of salt. Um, I don't know exactly the perspective of students when they were taking this, were they thinking about the hybrid model um, or were they thinking about the fact that they were all in school in June? And, you know, truthfully, um, I think they were happy to be in school full time. And with one caveat, I will say that um, I think the half day Wednesdays were um, a huge hit and success and a nice breather for kids. Um, the fact that those were gone um, 
I, I, and I know the kids really wanted to hang on to that. And I know it's, it's more complicated than just saying we're going to, you know, we're going to proceed. Uh, but this is definitely one, I, again, I like to see the decline, but I do think we take this with a grain of salt. Next slide. So supportive school, it, uh, I do like to see the fact that 76% of the students feel like they have an adult they can go to school. It's nice to see that there's an increase. And I think the fact that you can see a drastic increase in ninth graders um, is the product of the ninth grade academy. Um, and I think that's a testament just really to the, to the staff um, and not only the structure of ninth grade academy, but also staff. You know, there's one quote that uh, that has stuck with me from a guidance counselor who made the comment that you know that they they knew more kids by October um, than than really they did the whole previous year in terms of ninth graders. So um, you know it's been a really challenging year and a half. The ninth grade academy has been a, a success, and it's really a testament to really the leaders who have, have made that work. Next slide. So homework continues to be a, a, a topic of conversation, a constant struggle, uh, and really, really complex issue. Um, because again, if you drill down on the data before we talk just about the times, you know, you can also see that kids report, and I think they're being honest, and again, I see with my own children, that they're, they're not necessarily completely engaged with homework. And they are distracted and they are doing things in addition to their homework and whether that's email text you know TikTok, listening to music which no, isn't necessarily a distraction and i don't pass judgment in that um in that respect at all uh, you know i was a teenager too pre-cell phone but you know i get it right there's other things that are a little more appealing than doing a homework assignment you know with that being said i do think it might skew some of this data Nevertheless, I think it's uh, something we need to continue to work on is just reducing homework in general. Um, you know, the kids have a very busy day that start, starts very early, 6.30 in the morning, most likely getting up and it's a very long, dynamic and difficult day with kids running from class to class. I do wanna talk about that in a second in terms of passing time. Uh, and they are, we have more than 90, I think it's 97% of our kids involved in an extracurricular, at least one which is amazing, which I think is a positive. It is, it's, it's uh, you know, if you, it's certainly more than just academics that the kids are coming to school for. And we wanna make sure that they can enjoy their high school experience and extracurricular is a part of that. And we don't want homework to be, um, you, you know, to, to be a barrier. And it's something I talk about with kids often, even uh, the other day meeting with a student and a family about an issue unrelated, talking about the academics and, um, and you know, trying to, you know, to just uh, get the young lady to relax a little bit. She's very driven, excellent student, great kid. And I said, you know, if you're staying up till midnight every night doing homework, you know, you really have to assess whether or not a quality of life. And, and everybody laughed at the fact that midnight would have been an early evening. So, um, you know, sometimes we have to save kids from themselves. Uh, and even if you look at some of the data about what kids uh, wanted, it was like open enrollment in APs, for example. Um, which I understand from a student perspective that, why they would want that, uh, but that's only going to lead to more homework. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a struggle here. But anyways, so the average longest amount of time doing homework on a night is 3.1 hours too much. You know, we don't want to see any more than two and a half hours. I personally think that is still too much. Nevertheless, we have an agreement that it's going to be 25 to 30 minutes on average per class per night. And if you do the math, it works out to about two and a half hours. Um, I, you know, I do think it's important that we have these homework free weekends as well, um, because homework, it, it, it can't be busy work. And sometimes you start to question the value of it when there's too much of it. Um, and so you can see, I don't have to read all these, but you can see that it's, it's clearly an issue for students. 66% reported feeling often and always stressed due to homework. Um, and you know, the, the school in general is a welcoming, caring environment. It's very rigorous. It's very academically focused. All good things with the exception of, you know, you have to be really performing at your optimal to do well. And I know that uh, even as adults, how often do you walk into to work every day feeling at your 100%? So I think it's important to be, to be mindful of that. We do have one week in the month of no homework. And occasionally I like to slip in another one. Um, uh, just to provide some additional support for students. Uh, last slide. So some of the suggestions from uh, students for changes, 
Um, 53% add mental health resources. Um, I'm certainly not gonna suggest the students are wrong in this area. I will say it's probably a failure of mine. Um, we are well resourced and I think we have to make sure students know all the resources that are available to them. And we have actually made some efforts there in terms of, you know, for lack of a better term, just marketing and let, letting students know what their, not only mental health resources, but academic resources. 64% um, creating more time for students to work on homework and projects in school. I think it's a, uh, it's a, great, a great suggestion. Um, you know, 62% having teachers coordinate due dates for projects and assessments. Ninth grade academy does this really well. We do this really well as a school over right before the end of a quarter or before a break. We actually have schedules for what days there'll be assessments on. It gets a little more complicated to do it on a weekly basis. Um, and we also encourage students if they have more than two to uh, more than two in a day to be proactive and, and communicate with the teacher about um, you know, asking for a, a reprieve and maybe doing it the following day, but that's not always easy for a student, recognize that. 60% asking for, you know, more no homework on weekends. Had a student recently reach out and say, could we do that? Also some no homework during weekdays. Um, so we kind of started that di dialogue as well. And just overall, the reduction of home the homework load, 73% would, uh, we're asking for that. And I do think uh, everyone is well-intentioned and, uh, but I do think it's an area we could probably do a little, a little more on, but it, it's a little easier for me to say that sitting in the principal seat as opposed to trying to going back to harkening back to my days as a teacher and trying to get through the curriculum. So just a few other things to uh, point out that I thought were pretty interesting um, in, in the data just is I, I thought it was really great to see that 90% um, of the students report they feel like they are at least sometimes often or always meeting parental needs. And I think that um, parents have a greater appreciation of the stresses that are on kids and are really, um, you know, partners in this effort to reduce stress. Um, uh, I, and in terms of the passing time, I did want to make one point to that, where last year, the restrictions, the reduction of the 990 allowed us to do a 10 minute mass break. We had nine minute passing times. We had half day Wednesdays. You, you, those were really great changes. I'm not suggesting that we would uh, fully implement all those, you know, but when you're doing six classes and a lunch day with only four minutes between passing time, it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, you're, you're finishing one class, four minutes is not a long time to walk that building. You're immediately hopping into another class. And, and truthfully, it is a product of the schedule and just the state requirement of 990. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, it's not often in life that you're running even from meeting to, to meeting with only a couple minutes in between. So some of this is um, just a product of, of things that we have to deal with, but uh, the half day Wednesdays and longer passing times were definitely helpful in kind of reducing the stress. We do have a very long lunch, probably too long, but we're not going to uh, tackle that one. But uh, that's a lot from, uh, from that data, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Does anyone have questions? Um, I don't have questions, more just comments. Like, again, you know, the fact that you have kids that are able to reach out to adults, I think is huge. And I do think that, you know, the pandemic did help that. And I think kids actually had to reach out to adults. You know, they had to Zoom with a guidance counselor, Zoom with, you know, a tutor, Zoom with whoever. And that was a personal connection, even through the computer. So I, you know, yeah. it's hard to look at this data because it was done in the spring. I think kids feel much better right now. If you were to give them the survey right now, it would look very different than this. Yep. And, you know, I mean, I, I've been at the high school with kids for almost 10 years and it does feel less stressful. It definitely does. And I think that's a positive, but there's still, you've got, you know, the peer, peer to peer academic pressure that they put on themselves. You've got parents are involved, like everybody's got a hand in it. So, I mean, I don't know how to solve any of that, but it's an awareness of that. And it's not well, just... and it, it, Yeah, the, those, are, those are really good points, Tracy, because if you look at, um, to some of your points, if you look at the data, you, you will see, it does bear that out in terms of just the peer-to-peer -peer pressure, pressure they put in themselves. Um, you know, you have like 25% of the kids saying they're checking their grades daily. So, yeah, it's really hard to tackle that. And I think that is, 
a very long process. I, I will say that we're, we're, you know, sometimes um, some of the more hard charging kids when you're talking about this will suggest that you're trying to remove all stress from the situation. And, um, and that's not the case, that some stress is healthy. And, uh, you know, wanting to perform well is healthy. It, it's all about, you know, finding a balance and having the right perspective. And it's very easy as an adult to say that. But I think just the, the more we can talk about, you know, the kids are to do their very best, they're going to be successful, they're going to land where they belong. Uh, and we, uh, we don't have to put so much focus on the college process, the top 20 schools, and, and you know, in the competition. Um, but it is it's easier for an adult to say that, for sure. And is there any data that they pull on, you know, upper level classes like honors and AP classes, if those kids are reporting more stress than kids that are in- It, it does break it down by AP. Uh, it does not do it by the honors level. And you will see that um, there is a little more stress at the AP level, for sure. That one's a tricky one because it is a college level course. I will say that I think it's college level course in a high school uh, consumable product and not necessarily a college course. Um, our AP scores are off the charts and that's a great thing. I would, I would be okay with, uh, with, you know, do, with more force uh, and maybe um, less homework, uh, but that's not an indictment on a teacher either. I, I, I can respect that the job that they need to do and, and um, they have their own self-imposed pressure. Um, but, you know, oftentimes somebody will, I'll make a suggestion and someone will say, well, you have to realize the score is going to be lower. And I, my response is, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, our scores are really phenomenal. Um, and so, yeah, but yes, it does break it down that way. Too. Mike, you talked about that the, the kids don't seem to realize the supports that there are for them around, especially mental health supports. So how do, how do you deal, like, how do you address that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, oftentimes I think kids are, are afraid to ask for help. And I think the first place they should start is a guidance counselor. And there's clearly a spot where, you know, a guidance counselor role would end and a clinician's role would begin. But I think even reaching out first to the guidance counselor is a great way to start that discussion. Uh, also dovetailing just on the, on the data about students' willingness or, or having a, an adult they can, they can go to. Um, you know, I think that's a good way to start that conversation. You know, too often I will say that it's at the acute level when 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 we're we're dealing with it, um, and I don't know if if kids uh, I have to do a better job of marketing. I'll start with that, and I think we have to um, reduce the stigma around reaching out for help, and uh, and sometimes it's just a conversation, and and that's okay. But even even with kids that do ask for help, you have to be strategic where those meetings happen based on the student's comfort level because they don't want the stigma that they're, you know, they're seeking support. Um, I do think some of that is uh, stigma is washing away as, uh, you know, the, the just the therapy is, is more accepted uh, um, at this juncture. We have some great professionals that really care about kids. And, and oftentimes it, uh, when you're trying to sell it for lack of a better term to a student, you know, it's just a conversation with uh, a trusted adult where you can really say almost anything um, that maybe you're not comfortable saying to anybody else in your life. Thank you. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, yeah, yeah. I think it starts with me doing a better job of making sure kids know what their resources are. Well, you you take a lot on yourself. Uh, I, I think there's plenty of people, school committee included, who share these responsibilities, but I'm struck with three things. Uh, one, that uh, both of you bring a, a great deal of uh, very genuine uh, sensitivity to these issues. And even though the, this was June data, you're not discounting it. You're, you're framing it as June data, but you're not discounting it. It's real data. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, I'm, I'm distressed, I'm not surprised, but distressed uh, to see that 65% reported that often or not, uh, 
uh, often or always, they worry about not doing well in school. Mm. And I think this reminds us that we're teaching kids what well means. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we've got the right set of metrics in front of them. Yeah. Uh, yep. Thirdly, what is not mentioned here is teachers are in the same environment. Mm. And I think we, we need to care for them as well. Yep. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, the kid, we often talk about kids learn from failure and the importance of failure in life, and, you know, the characteristics and the, you know, just the, how you can grow from that. But truthfully, it's the environment, particularly the college process, makes kids feel in a way that failure is actually not an option. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think, I, it's really hard to be a teenager right now. Mm -hmm. And I will say that, you know, these kids are, are just super impressive and you know I do think that they're going to be fine in the end but <clears throat> I would say that I think it's harder to be a teenager now than it ever has been and some might say uh you know you can harken back to to a different time and it was it was harder in a different way and, and I don't disagree um with some of those uh, but overall I think if you look at the the entire picture to be a teenager now is not easy and I think these kids are you know they're resilient they're they're better educated they're smarter they're driven they're more creative uh, you know they give you they certainly give you hope about the future when you look at the kids in, in the high school for sure mm -hmm. hi can i go yeah. <laughs> hi mr Mastrola. it's hi. really good to, it's really good to hear that um you know there's so much sensitivity around um uh the emotional well-being of our students uh, and I, I know that um, the, this data is early uh, in the school year. I wonder if uh, you're seeing an increase in, um, in uh, students um, being in crises or uh, needing to really talk to as the year is, has been progressing through. Uh, that will be one, mm -hmm. one of my questions. The other question is, uh, were you able to capture any data around um, executive functioning of the students, like organization uh, uh, for the students when it comes to their email boxes, um, the amount of emails that they are getting. Uh, the reason why I ask about that is that uh, when our students transition to high school, uh, out of high school to universities, there is that need for preparedness uh, for the new way of communication. And it was definitely stress during, you know, there was, uh, there was definitely much more need for that type of communication with teachers during pandemic and, and at the high school, but that becomes uh, the primary source of advocating for yourself, communicating with your professor. Um, are we equipping, equip, um, uh, uh, making sure that our students are equipped and are, they are practicing those, those um, uh, skills um, at home right now? Uh, do they do we have any data of how they're managing their mailboxes are they late learning those skills do they feel organized because that's big part of you know not being stressed that i forgot something uh knowing wh what you know what assignments are happening or um is a big part of a stress uh, uh, reducing stress in the class yeah it's a good question so there, there really isn't any data captured capturing that but your point is well taken in terms of um, preparing kids and within it from an executive functioning standpoint, the ninth grade academy, there is a focus on that, about straight organization, about making sure that we're speaking the same language across disciplines, that we're teaching kids how to take notes properly in each discipline. So there definitely is a focus in ninth grade. And I think if you're a special ed student, particularly if your goal is around executive function, you're getting a lot of support in that area in grades 10, 11, and 12. And I think for, for kids that are, that are not, that are performing either average or well, or even better, uh, you know, they're not getting that support and they probably do need it. Um, it is about how, where you find the time to do that, to actually implement that. In terms of the organization and self-advocacy, just overall, you know, I do think that is a collaborative effort with, with families too. Um, and, you know, teaching the, your uh, just children how to, you know, how to advocate for themselves um and and some organization strategies are helpful i will say the kids do not not all a lot of kids don't read email 
and it's a problem. Um, you know, I, I think I've told the story before, and it'll be quick. But we, you know, we had a I have an advisory, and we had a nice laugh because you know, you know I have a I, I have a an email address where all the kids are on it. We have a shared calendar, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I have one student you know, who I adore, but he's, you know, he's, he's I didn't get I didn't I didn't get this information. What are you talking about? What do you want me to do? And so we had him pull his email up and then search my name. And it was just a sea of unread emails. And so we got a good chuckle about it. But I think um, encouraging kids to read email would be helpful. Uh, yeah, to that point, um, I looked at my daughter's email, uh, um, mail, email box and uh, it's cluttered with like reminders and all of that stuff. So um, I wonder if we are, you know, desynthesizing kids uh, to email besides the point. Yeah. We're, I think all humans. Um, and, yes, I would. Yes, agree. and it's you know in a professional life you you'll find you know it's it's an ongoing uh, problem. Um, so so unfortunately, uh, it's it's it, there is probably not an um, it's it's not an easy solution. Uh, and then I had another question about um, how does the information flow happens from feedback from students? Is there a way that you, you know uh, then if Students feel, is there a process where um, you, uh, the administration can assess, you know, survey is great, but as you're going through the year, is there a process where uh, administration can assess sort of like where uh, the needs are of the students, where are the most, you know, where are the areas of most complaints? Like, are you able to adjust and, you know, address those questions? Like how would that flow of information happen to, heads of the departments, to administration, to teachers, uh, just to understand what the students are going through. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I, I do think we, we kind of capture it anecdotally in, in, in different areas. Um, you know, additional surveys might, are not a bad idea. I do think we have to be careful not to survey too much. The kids sometimes complain that they're, you know, survey exha exhaustion. You know, and then we have, we, we're meeting with kids, different um, kids, different groups, I get some anecdotal um, uh, data, but information, but, you know, I think we probably could have a, a more systemized approach to it as well. Um, and, you know, when, when we talk about stress in general, if you, and if you looked at a bar graph, there's, you know, there's certain pressure points where it just, it's, the kids are more anxious and whether it's seniors around November 1st deadline or you know, the student body in general around the end of a quarter, you know, how it factors in with uh, athletics and shows. So, you know, there are different points in the year that tends to be a little more stressful. But to answer your question, I think, um, you know, I think we do do a decent job of capturing it in different ways, uh, but, but certainly could do a better job capturing it, some of these more important questions with the entire student body. And a quick follow-up, is the information from, so the students go to guidance counselor, is that information flowing anywhere or like how does that work? What information and oh, oh, it just, you're talking in general, like then how yeah. would it come to it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it, I guess it depends on the, on the issue. So we do have um, a student intervention team that meets every Tuesday. You know, that's usually trying to almost like a case study of students that are struggling in many areas. Um, if it is a, if it's a student, special ed student, and it's an academic um, issue, it might go to the case manager, it might go to the teachers, it, you know, if it's a, if, if it's an issue related to, you know, where students struggling socially, it might flow to us. Um, so, you know, I do think we, we, we don't necessarily have a flow chart about, you know, what issue would go to who and when. But I do think it's just really important that we keep open lines of communication at, as a school. And, and, and so we certainly work closely with our department chairs, part of the leadership team with, with Allison Nowicki is, is the one for, is the leader of the, uh, the guides chair. So, um, you know, I think people do know where to go in terms of staff, they do know where to go depending on what the issue is. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Mike. Yes, thank you thank very you. much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. Appreciate Just one last thank you to CEF because yes, absolutely. they covered a substantial price tag for the survey and we're just really grateful. And it came with this really big commitment to the kids' well-being, especially during the pandemic, yes. um, to, so that we could get this
benchmark data and see where our kids were in the spring as we got to that place in time. So just very grateful for that. Support. And is it appropriate for them to receive some of this data? So or? I let them know you were getting this tonight. So I don't know if any of them are on the call, but they know that we were sharing out tonight. So they're aware and certainly interested. I expect they'll watch the recording. Great. Great. Sure. Thank you, Concord Ed Fund. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, thank you for pointing out, Lori. I can't say enough about Concord Ed Fund and the yeah. Parents Association. I mean, the efforts are just really amazing. So thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thank Bye. you. All right, Jared. A little bit of a shift. A little shift. <laughs> Capital plan. Capital plan worksheet. Yes, so um, I was asked to just put together um, this spreadsheet and take off all of the estimated costs um, for discussion. I'll add to that with yeah. the intent to have you dialogue about where you might want to yes. place the proposed projects or not place the proposed projects. Those are the choices you have. Um, we had Jared's team had drafted out mm -hmm. ideas earlier this fall. So there is a version attached to one of the previous agendas where we sketched out some ways you could approach it. Mm -hmm. But we, I think the chairs wanted you to have an open slate. So great. Talk, talk it yeah. through. Thank you for giving us that opportunity. Um, I'm curious, the, uh, the amenities, two, call, two rows here, and the lighting and paving have been in front of us for some time now. Yeah. The tractor and or trailer, very new. The turf field has been something that ebbs and flows. Uh, so I wonder if we might start with, with these questions uh, around turf field is there a shelf life uh and very different question around uh the lighting and paving uh is anybody qualified to tell us at what point that reaches a level a, a safety threshold that demands more attention than it has for the last five years mm -hmm. a tough question i know yeah, but i sure. you know who yeah. could we turn to to Give us an objective opinion about uh, how how we're uh, uh, on borrowed time. What kind of borrowed time? Yeah. So you know, we we've had Gale Engineering look at the road, and DPW did an in-depth engineering study of the road. Everyone agrees it needs. There's no question it needs hmm. to be addressed. In terms of the urgency, um, we do our best to maintain, to keep up with the potholes mm -hmm. and the wear and tear so that it stays as safe as possible. Um, I think that's where you're at is, are we to that point? We're managing that. I think we could a little bit longer, but at some point we have to actually do it because we all know if you patch and patch and patch and patch, the, the decay just gets worse. So, so the moment in time is the question court. That's exactly right as to where we are. We, thought it was pretty important a couple of years ago when we brought it to town meeting mm -hmm. and um, are still having the same discussion. The lighting we've band-aided a bit along the way, added a couple of poles here and mm -hmm. there, tried to take some of the spots that seemed the biggest safety concerns and address those. Could it be better? Yeah, it, it could if we did the whole roadway. And this, like there is a there is a preferred lighting plan that is in existence somewhere i just probably yeah, it's it. part of the and it's part of this estimate been done yep and so the work has been done um the the design work has been done yes. do you have to redo any of that i don't think so no i don't think so there's no, nothing substantial that's changed there we'd want someone to endorse that but right i don't believe there's huge changes to come and this has been i mean this has been topic of discussion for many many years i mean for me personally i think this is a huge priority to finish that building and you know i i look at it as we're entering into another building project i, I think the elephant in the room is kind of it, it was never finished the roadway wasn't finished the lighting was finished we had to go back to the town and you know maybe we have to go back to the town again but i do think it should be a priority for this community to really dig into and this would include the sidewalks correct mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. Those are not really in very good shape. 
I mean, you could argue they're not really accessible. They're not really accessible, right? Yeah. I mean, I think an accessibility a wheelchair. Is, is, yeah. is definitely tough yeah. going. It's yeah. just so heavily used. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like this is not some area to the side. No. No. <laughs> you no. know, I mean, the and history and exit and yeah. primary path. Or it's, it's not it's peachy. Such a it's busy, not, you know, campus. right. It's yeah, not I mean, Ripley. It's everyone's right. using it it's all year long. Two town all day community long. campus. Yes. Yeah. And it is with a rec center. The yes. Best thing, like, it's so great to see everyone there. That, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So, one suggestion I know that the town has a very aggressive paving project for 2023. So maybe we could and get a sort of an economy of um, maybe uh, maybe what? So the the town has a very uh, so they're uh, back uh, they're way behind in their paving, so they're doing like twice the amount of work this year, yeah. 2023. Yes, sorry, not this year, um, and that's that's about all I know about it. Uh, so I'm just wondering if we could get an economy of scale of mm -hmm. you know a big paving company comes in twice or three times next yeah, year yeah. to do work. Yeah. This is all I know. It's like sometimes the town will do stuff in the fall, and that's mm -hmm. probably not a good time to do paving work at the high school. I'm just saying, I'm not an expert. <laughs> um, so it's definitely probably, yeah, probably a, a summer, summer project. project. Yeah. Um, but I, I just don't know if we could. You can find out something talk out with them regularly. I feel comfortable. Yeah, and I can talk to Alan. The only thing I'm concerned with is the timing because yep. uh, of town meeting passing it. They book up all of their summer work. Yep um late right. winter really early spring and i don't know if the time when is town i should know this late 20, may yeah. 20, so yeah. that a little late yeah mm -hmm. that's but the only concern we'll always be in that you know that's <laughs> we have correct that. but even if it was a summer out yeah i right. would at least have it allocate the money yeah. Would be made. Right. yeah yeah sure More exactly specifically the funding could be yeah because i there. know it's not a yeah. It's not a fall or winter project Correct. for sure. Um, so we'll just have to, because we're always going to be in that town, unless they move town meeting to February, which I don't think is happening. But then to that end, would you want it on, if it's going to be something that passes in April, May, but wouldn't happen till the following June or July, you'd want to probably prioritize it. Mm -hmm. yep. Even once it gets approved, it's still not happening for a while, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Likely, right. unless we get lucky. You know, I would talk to an expert and find out um you know what how much it would go up uh, each year the increase the percentage um yep, yeah. if we're a year out i threw in 10 to 20 percent that was a number that i heard which is probably high yep. i think 10 percent could be an accurate number mm -hmm. I mean, we've had sticker shock on this yeah. number for and did they... day one <laughs> so yeah. Did they say how many days it would take? Like, is there any estimate as to how long it would take? I don't know. We've been yeah. on the receiving end of a brand new street, you know, in yes. my neck of the woods, right, this year. And and there were multiple streets that were done. And it was literally a two-day project. It's usually quick. It's so and fast. it yeah. was so fast. And, you know, when it was still usable, like not ideal, like not, you know, don't One lane in the or morning, whatever, but, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you just wonder if it could, you know, if, if maybe it lined up with the calendar somehow and there was a professional day, I don't know, yeah, all the stars would have to align, months, but we can do just about anything. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you right. could get an, an idea as to the duration, yeah. Sure. Yeah. they could say, well, we have to take it down to this right. it's a 10 right. day thing. I don't know. It's, I'm not, yeah. in, no yeah. idea. Yeah. So we'll get some follow up. <laughs> and it's thing. just, it it's just be. the walkway, the, not the walkway, the driveway. It's not the parking lot. Right. It's just the driveway right. and it's not the, the upper the driveway. Road in front of Beatty. Just the beating section. Walled into Thoreau, yeah. the whole length. Horseshoe there, yeah. But not the upper. Not the upper. Okay. That was all done in the building. Yep. What would think you could close it down to the you know, once, and then you could get okay. the other. Do a little half and half or something. I don't know. You just never know. Yeah. All right. Okay. It could be all remote. I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so straw poll, it sounds like, is there anybody who objects to putting the paving and lighting in the number one, in the 23 position? How to do it. I love that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder for process, you would need a warrant article in both towns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you want us to try to plot 24, 25, 26, 27? I think we have to, right? right your plan so it might make it easier to 
So the turf field, when was expected? I think I said placement. I said for three to five years, which would put us at um, uh, 26. Okay. Sure. We'll slap that one in at 26. And can I just Perfect. ask, does any of that uh, money come from the athletic revolving accounts or no? It could. Okay. It, it could. I mean, it can decide that. Yeah. Okay. And you have, what did they put aside? 200,000? Um, Didn't we talk about some money? Oh, stabilization. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Time yeah. Time in the athletic. The, no, no, no. Stabilization account. Stabilization. Thank yeah. you. I was calling. That's the word. So you have started with that intent that it could go to that. Mm -hmm. And then, so the campus tractor trailer. Yeah. So that is something that we feel could pay for itself over, you know, four or five years. Um, it's a wish, but it's certainly something that would fit into a capital. It would be primarily, it would be 100% used at the high school. Uh, we do have an outside contractor that comes in and helps with um, uh, with the snow removal, et cetera, uh, that would reduce those costs significantly. Um, and this has been on, since I've, since I've been here, even with the prior uh, maintenance manager, this has been a wish. Mm -hmm. Okay. When we discussed this before, did we talk about trying to get some kind of analysis of of savings and and all that? I thought I can I can provide that. that. We did that. We yeah. had that conversation. Okay. I can bring that for next week. Yeah. So help me understand: big enough for plowing, but small enough for mowing and seeding. With a number of tricky. Is that a tricky uh, equation for putting a vehicle on the road and, and on the fields? I don't think so. I think okay. I don't know. Yeah, I know it. I have a visual in my head of what it looks like, um, and it can be used um, all seasons. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would save. It would save on um, not only contract services but time. That's the other thing. Time is money. It would save. It would save. Save on time as well. But for plowing, for example, if we had one vehicle doing the play, I mean, right now when we have a contracted service, they have. Yeah, so the, so we do a lot of our we do a lot of our own plowing. Okay. Uh, one of the issues, though, is when the snow piles up, you need the big moving ones. it, yeah, piling it up, yes. um, and we hire uh, a contractor for that. You need the big vehicles, <laughs> strong. So what about if we slot the building design for the amenities building and the tractor trailer in FY24 and then put the amenities building in FY25 and then we don't have enough stuff to FY27 is open for now right could you put the um the building design in 23 also no, I I feel like that's just another one of those places so I personally cannot stomach building a building with 20 bathrooms. I know, but it's never going to change, correct? I, I think we should go back. Can we go back to the, I think we should work with the town and actually go back to the plumbing, yeah. whatever they're called, and figure out if we can find an alternative solution, aka having plushless toilets. Like what, require, what is the tipping factor for having to do 20 bathrooms? Is it sewer? Is it... Mm -hmm. Plumbing, what is it? Right. Because I do think that is also an accessibility issue. You know, you look at the porta potties down there, and there's really no way. I, I mean, yeah. I, if, or we could, if you have anyone in your family in a wheelchair, you understand what or it's Or we like. could tow in something yeah. like the Concord Rec uses, which would be significantly less money at the White Pond that has wheelchair accessible bathrooms. But it's temporary, correct? They, they bought it. They bought it. Yeah, they tow it into White Pond, and then I don't know where it goes in the winter. I know we've we borrowed it a couple times yeah. already yeah. <laughs> for graduation yeah. and things. I had no idea how much it costs, but I have mm -hmm. to think it's mm -hmm. not 100K. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I no. am learning through the building project as we learn on different bathroom options and gender neutral things that 
uh, architects design team and I actually got CC'd on an email that one of our students wrote to the LGBTQ lead at, at DESE that looped back to our architects because they're the group that works with DESE on the plumbing codes. It's an, an internally long process that hmm. the codes just move at snail's pace. No matter how much pressure is coming, the, the plumbing board just moves very slowly. So but I, I find it difficult to believe the facility has not changed. We just turfed it. So how does it all of a sudden become a stadium? It's just a field with. Yeah, it's your it's your capacity for seating capacity. is what I understand. But if we could just check in with them that we yeah. 100% we yeah. could not be grandfathered in because the bleachers didn't change. Mm -hmm. like, the facility didn't right usually code once you start making adjustments you're you're on the hook for all the mm -hmm. recent codes the new codes whatever you were grandfathered through does it evaporate but we didn't really build anything that's the thing i mean it's as yeah if we it's built worth something. arguing the point i hear mm -hmm. i hear what you're no, saying we just yeah. I, I looked at it yeah. google earth it's just moved yeah mm. right Turf. totally right we, we didn't all right so let's work on that you know thing. Code. But I think it is once you start pulling permits, then you have to yeah. be up to code. I don't know. You know, yeah. and that's and and with all the paving that was done down to they had to pull permits. Yeah, oh, that. I think so. Oh, so, well, let's just. Yeah. I, yeah. I personally would will vote no, because <laughs> I we just kind of got to find a better solution. Something with the new because I I saw their flushless toilets, not, you know, but you still need plum. You know, you need water to go into it. So. Mm -hmm that isn't the solution, then I don't have an idea. Well, I wonder if we might even do some uh, investigation, not through any permitting authorities, but through some of the vendors of the kind of technologies you're talking about, because they've, they've got their experience in, in public sector work right. that they can tell us about and give us the information it, it, faster just a, than anybody else. It's just else. a more elegant and sort of, you know, <laughs> uh, you still have to, it goes into a, Thing it still needs to be pumped, but it's not it's not smelly or you know. <laughs> what if we right. could be more sustainable and uh, a great deal more economical yeah. and not overbuild and address uh, the needs of uh, folks who have different uh, access uh, mm -hmm. requirements? And that's I completely agree with you. I find the lack of wheelchair access mm -hmm. slash easy access to be it's not sustainable. It's not friendly it's not welcoming um yeah. so i agree with you i just would like to find not a 1.6 million dollar solution <laughs> or whatever the total is i'm not good at math right yeah so and is 20 the total number for um all gender bathrooms like is it is it a total of 20 it's bathrooms? based on your capacity in the stadium okay. which would technically by code put you at 44 40, yeah. If we get a design built, we can apply for a waiver to drop it to 22 because you're going to be able to say we don't use it except for, you know, yeah. football games and graduation, whatever. The ratio mm -hmm. seems really bonkers. It's really to your point, it's off. bonkers. Yeah, it's, there will never be 40 people. Yeah. We have a, such a limited amount of space. Like, yeah. it's good. Yeah, it's, bon it's totally to your point, it's and, bonkers. And the bathrooms on the upper turf field, how did those get in just? You know, is that because it's not a stadium? Bleacher right. size. Oh, that's remember. Awesome. There's hardly all about bleachers. Yeah. yeah, all about the bleachers. Okay. Take a bleachers. And we've been told if we apply for 22, that's as good as we can expect to get because that'd be 50 percent of yes. The, right. Yes, I remember that. The boilerplate requirement. So regardless, we're looking at 20 bathrooms, no matter what From system what we're we have. told, uh, if we if we were to reduce it, we'd be the first, is what okay. we were told. That's okay. my understanding. So, okay. So far in the research we've done. Is there is there a requirement that the bathrooms have to be accessible through the uh, all seasons, including winter, or you can shut everything down in the winter? My, I believe it's based on your usage of the stadium. Yep. So a Thanksgiving Day game, even in a snowstorm, would have to be accessible mm -hmm. to yeah. the restrooms. Yeah. No, it has to be a. Uh, yeah winterized or whatever facility mm -hmm. i think the town's appreciative of your challenge because mm. we aren't getting cited on these topics you're bringing up right now <laughs> as they sort of understand the same sentiment cynthia is expressing well wow, that's a lot of money for what what this mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. but it does just sit around us i know kate has yeah. hodges has done a lot of research on these 
toileting facilities. So yeah, we can, we'll call her for a good toileting check. So, because Jared gets to do that. <laughs> I know she did research on. She did do uh, a lot with White Pond. And no, the other. I'm now I'm forgetting. Um, they need to put bathrooms in at the new Juro. Juro. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they had any hookups there whatsoever. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I can't. Remember she landed on that one. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. So we've got some resources available there. Yep. A uh, couple of comments, Sarah. If I may, just to continue to move this. Um, I want to speak more about uh, the the tractor and the trailer, and do we need to house it somewhere, or is this uh, one and done? And Cynthia, to your point about where we might slot different things, I'd be content only voting uh, uh, on uh, what we might put forward at the next yeah. town meeting and have everything else uh, be penciled in at this point. Yep. Great. I like that idea. Back to the trailer, do we need to uh, put a roof over it? Do we need to tuck it? Yeah, I um, I think that that it would be part of all of this price. Um, I, 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 I think you would need like a little hut. Yeah. And I, I'm gonna get more information for you for next week though on that. Okay, good. Okay, okay. So we have repaving and, and lighting. Emily. And uh, so we'll bring, bring the follow up to you next week. Yep. Okay. That's good. We, like we were thinking of a vote for next week, but yep. I think you have a little more time into January, right? The mm -hmm. warrant closes mm -hmm. January. And yep. I would hope that uh, the town government and BD is fully apprised of our thinking. Yeah, we'll be sure of that as well. Yes, very important. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Uh, oh, policies. So I think I can speak to it, but I want uh, my colleagues on the committee and, and Lori to listen carefully and step in where I blunder. Um, we have first uh, for adoption tonight, JJF student activity accounts, and this would be the proposed policy that we looked at last meeting. Mm -hmm. Secondly, JFABB admission of exchange students. This would be new to us uh, and consistent with MASC. The, Is this totally different than the one we looked at last year? Um, or the same one? I think it's almost the same. No. Okay. This is back to the original. This okay, so this is just the old one we looked at. Yeah. Great. But I thought I just was. JJH searches and, and interrogations. Uh, this is MASC. Therefore, I think there's some minor changes there. JJIF athletic concussion. This would be our policy that was MASC, but we're adding the MASC reference. Mm -hmm. That remains uh, true again for uh, JICC student conduct on school buses. And if there is a motion to adopt those, let's wrap it into a, a second part of the motion, which is that uh, JICC-R student conduct on school buses is to be removed because that would be a handbook kind of item. Mm -hmm. So uh, the motion would be to adopt the uh, proposals that received first reading uh, at our previous meeting of JJF, JFABB, JJH, JJIC, JICC, and removal of JICCR. All right. Okay. Somebody care to Very say nice the words? Very nice job, Court. So Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Policy. Thank you, Policy Subcommittee. We vote them one by one. So we oh, move. We, we, we discussion. We discussion now. Yeah. You know. Yes. One by one. We have done a consent agenda on a large larger list like that, okay. and then you just call out the ones you don't want to yep. go through. Great. So okay. Up to you. If there's no discussion, then they looked great. They read well. Good. 
I move that they, uh, if I can move on to the action item, yes, uh, sir. move that they uh, uh, be adopted as proposed. The uh, five uh, that are updated and adopted as discussed and the sixth uh, student contact uh, that be removed from the policy handbook. Second that. Um, we don't have to, we don't have to go through and see if anyone wants to, if everyone's in. Let's second it. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'll vote for it too. Anderson, I for both. <laughs> Booth, I for both. Morano, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Rainey, I for both. And Wilson for region. All right. Okay. I uh, will return to public comment now. If there are or any public comments, please raise your hand using the participant tab. And seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the regional part of this meeting. So moved for, for the region. So moved for. No, we just need oh, a I second it? Okay. I'm like, what are you for the region? What am I doing? Second. Anderson, I. With I. Morano I. Mustafi I. Rainy I. Wilson I. Thank you All very right. much. Thank you. you. Concord School Committee will remain in session. Is everybody able to go through our remaining items without a break? I'd love a one minute break just to get some water. One minute break? Nine. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And welcome back. Concord School Committee is back in session and we are on agenda item, the Concord Middle School Building Project Update. And I will defer to my colleagues who are on the Building Committee to provide us an update and then we'll proceed from there. I can go through the more simple things first sure. that are just straightforward. Um, we have really up our engagement with the community, which has been really successful, actually. We've had the last few weeks, we have focused on our what I call like smaller engagements with um, you, you, smaller groups, um, a lot of school groups, um, townwide groups. We will continue engaging with um, groups that request our presence and that we also reach out to. We are setting up many of those dates in the early part of this month. You know, it will sort of slow down the closer we get towards the end of the month. But we do have three engagement opportunities this week alone. Tomorrow night, we have another big forum. Um, oh, no, I guess then we have our meeting on uh, on Thursday morning, and then we will um, engage with the League of Women Voters on their first Friday series um, this Friday morning. The following week, we will have um, a panel discussion on sustainability. Matt Root, our subcommittee chair, will lead that with um, someone from the Concord Climate Action Board, as well as um, one of the experts at our design firm, SMMA. Um, there are some other big ones coming up, but those are the ones that off the top of my head I can remember. Um, so we are in, we're in, we're in full swing here. And I think people have been grateful and we're grateful for the engagement and I'm just going to keep at it. Great. What else? Uh, at the, the, the most recent <laughs> meeting of the full committee on the 18th of November, uh, we did our second round of value management where we looked at where we can make some adjustments that wouldn't uh, uh, harm the education plan and space for teaching and learning. Uh, the result of that was a, a new total project budget as we know it now. A lot of uncertainties, of course, about uh, construction to be happening in the future. Mm -hmm. But with contingencies of 5% for construction, 5% for soft costs, and 2.5% for a bidding contingency, we are going to bring in the project at the present time at $102,716,610. This is a uh, million dollars under the approved amount 
of uh, 103.7 uh, from the select board, the, the number they'd like to uh, see the committee achieve. And this Thursday, uh, much of the discussion uh, will take a look at the way in which the uh, soil is going to be moved around uh, such that we can excavate and build and then refill. Uh, the, the idea of moving soil sounds simple. It's not. It's a lot of <laughs> trucks and a lot of cost. Uh, so uh, there could be a, a swing of half a million dollars here, depending on how we do it around numbers. Um, so that's going to get a careful look this week, as will ventilation. Uh, we don't have a strict metric that we want to hit for cubic feet uh, per minute moving through uh, uh, or uh, or parts per million uh, of uh, uh, what co co right carbon dioxide uh, yep. um, uh, oh so we do have industry standards around that but there's no fixed number that we have to hit so this is going to be really a uh a judgment call based on the best science we can bring to uh the debate okay it should be an interesting meeting mm -hmm. for sure <clears throat> so when is the is there another meeting before the special hearing special town meeting hearing mm -hmm. we meet on thursday this thursday yes then again, do you meet again if you know so the goal that's the question okay can we resolve those two Mm -hmm. big things soil and ventilation on thursday as a committee and there's no other value management on the table right at this time we are not planning to revisit that at this point okay and then well, less the contingencies we're just over 100 million yeah so when you look at the raw costs it's what 100 million point six no but contingencies are important <laughs> what okay the contingency has to be built into your budget no i, I get that but i'm just saying you're trying to finalize this Thursday. Yeah, we Correct. approached it from easiest to hardest or mm -hmm. less costly to most and got the easier, less costly things resolved. And now you've got the hard, hardest, biggest price tags left to discuss. And in terms of ventilation, is there, you know, an expert that's advising the committee or does the committee have discussion about that? You know, is there any, you know? Uh, the answer is no, uh, number okay. one. Number two, uh, much of our data is coming from other schools that have recently been built, uh, the Kennedy, for example, okay. in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask questions, uh, what does it mean to uh, reach uh, 600 parts per million, mm -hmm. uh, 800 parts per million, and so on. Um, uh, and there, does the Cambridge there, School Committee have a policy regarding ventilation? Uh, we're going to have to find that out before Thursday. I was okay. in touch mm -hmm. with the chairs today. They are rapidly trying to gather the data necessary for a good discussion Thursday. So we're we're down to the wire, and okay. they know that uh, they're still scrambling for data from the OPM and the, the design team on this. As I think it's as, also worth noting. I think people's the the focus on ventilation vis-a-vis -vis COVID has mm -hmm. really, oh, yes. mm -hmm. I think, changed yeah. these metrics. You yes. know, so, you know, the the idea that like some school might have a longstanding policy is probably unlikely. I mean, we'll look, you know, obviously we'll look. I don't know. It's, just, it's really interesting, right? Um, because this is, this probably wouldn't be. Oh, no. A, you no, know, at the forefront discussion. of what we're finding to be really tricky, no, we, right? We would take a default off yeah. the yeah. shelf yeah. Yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and we'd be fine with it. We'd right. be happy with it. Yeah. Uh, one of the discussions I had with somebody recently was, well, make make the ducks bigger so that if you need to beef <laughs> up the system later, you can. Well, you can't do it that way. No. It's, not, it's not that simple. No. Everything's yeah. got to no. interrelate. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, it's not a very sophisticated system. Yes. Uh, so we're looking at it from uh, the individual uh, human being level. Okay. What, what, right. what, what airflow do we need per yeah. person? Yeah. And it's tricky because our sustainability subcommittee who has done the lion's share of the work to get us this far, it's worth noting to you that they did not reach consensus on whether to recommend this ventilation system or not. So then it's like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> You, know, you kind of wish they did when so you're, it's going to be when a you're me in court. Well, and well, to <laughs> Lori's point, vote. yeah, to Lori's point, we may or may not be able to uh, uh, 
bring this to uh, some some conclusion Thursday. If it needs more work, it's going to need more work. Uh, I'm I don't know. I'm not going to predict. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you are either. We're not going to. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see what happens. We'll do what we have to do. Sure. Uh, is is the commitment we're yes. prepared to make. Usually when we're talking value engineering, we're talking reducing costs. This is an add on. Yes. Yeah. This is additional to what where we're at right now. So it's it's a lot to think about. Regarding uh, the dirt, <clears throat> if we store on site as much as possible, does it create any safety issues? Um, we have a plan that we're reviewing right now that uh, we just got today or yesterday from SMMA mm -hmm. to answer that question, both at Sanborn and if they use the space, the field down at Peabody. Um, having been on construction sites with kids, literally- Which field by Peabody? The lower Peabody field. This is a town issue as well. Yes, in fact, the request to consider it came from the town, so. From the recreation <laughs> group? Probably not. Um, <laughs> We're considering, I mean, my personal feeling is right now that whole middle school property, we're going to have to re reset where all the field activities are happening for years. Mm -hmm. Well, but I think that's one of the lifeboats was going to be the Peabody field. All I know is I was asked by the town manager to consider it because that's something they have access to. But I think we're going to need to be very transparent at yeah, the hearing. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. They're looking that. at 2229 as well. Yes, they are. Yeah. yeah, which would be and much maybe less. even other sites. I don't know. Is the town? I think they're looking at others with. Sure. Um, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say yet because they sent me one quick email yesterday afternoon. It sounds like they're looking at others with less optimism. Two two nine sounds pretty, pretty positive. I think. Can you clarify what two two nine is? That's oh. the the start. Oh, okay. Right. Sports. My and my my guess, my uninformed guess is, once you put dirt on a truck, it's uh, the mileage is not really what does no, it. It's, no, no. Uh, the truck having to go. To put it on yeah. a truck and then yeah. tip it somewhere. Yes. And will it be usable after you store it at the Sturmet site? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Everything that has to be capped, I believe, is capped there. Don't quote okay. me. I'm yeah, not yeah, authority, yeah. No. but. Uh, uh it, it's not a it's not an imminent hazard to anybody okay 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 well we'll we'll wait for your meeting we were asked about peabody in terms of our usage of peabody i assume the town's talking to its own mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. heavily used yes having dri driving by that every weekend yeah, you're right there yeah. yes yeah um and then solar because i know this is going to come up at the at the hearing i i have uh heard so this is unofficial but i have heard that uh uh, members of the light board, if not the light board themselves, are uh, really engaged in this. Uh, okay, good. Uh, now, I don't have good. any other details. Yeah, no, neither. Okay, sounds good. I did let Dave Wood know you might reach out to okay, that's chair nice. the light board. Thank you. So, Phil, please go ahead. Great. Anything else on the middle school? We'll just wait for here. There will be much more. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tonight, I should say. Yeah. Uh, great. The next topic is the CPS capital plan. So we have your document with all of your detailed recommendations. You, anything, anything new to add? Um, uh, we've had this for a while. Yeah, uh, no, this is still our, uh, our recommendations. Um, I recommend no changes, your priority. And has the town manager's office confirmed their town meeting number for CPS capital? Of 900, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, then for the 23 projects, so are there... So the Alcott boiler and controls, is there any, are there any grants or anything associated with that now, right? No, but we can always, we can always certainly look into that and okay. that'd be a good introduction for me and the new sustainability manager. That would be good. Um, and have, <clears throat> do we have energy audits on, let's say Alcott, Thoreau, especially Ripley that we've done? We have Ripley. 
Okay. We've done that since I've been here. Okay. I don't. Do we have on the other ones? I thought we did everything. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll look Katie into that. Katie only worked with us to yeah. do those. So it'd be good just as far as the new sustainability director goes, if she's aware of those, she has those. Yeah. Um, and just. She, she has them. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be good. Um, they must have them because they actually made a chart comparing all the buildings in Sanborn and Ripley were off the charts. <laughs> Not surprising. Not good thing. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah we have one. Yeah. We have a dashboard. Yeah. yeah. I have. A... I guess my question is: Is there anything else we can do? Is there any more low-hanging fruit at Ripley, in terms of making it like we have all LEDs, we have all the easy things? Yes. Or no? We'll have to go back and remind ourselves. We lived a few lives since the mm -hmm. review was done, so we'll okay. go back and take a look. Okay. I was just. Yeah. No, it's a good. Good question. I know it's it's probably not a, it's just probably not a lot of money, but just yeah, to, it's sure. good to look at whatever we can. Um, what other questions do people have? And I assume so. <clears throat> just going through the carpet tile replacement, you said Alcott would be the focus, so that would be pretty much all Alcott the fifty five for FY for FY twenty three. Yep, and then. I assume the other two are uh, Willard and Thoreau. Yep. Will we save any money because of the Repair. redone 94 wing? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll not have to touch that for a long time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what percentage of the school approximately is it? A quarter? It's eight classrooms, yeah. so it's, it's probably a quarter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, One floor. Angel yeah. refers to it as a quarter when we okay, talk that's, in big picture. So that's... Nice. Well, significant. No, there was definitely work you were going to do there. I, and I would have prefer not to have gotten to it this no, way. No, and I would have. Happening. Do you think it's going to be a little more energy efficient, the wing, with the work? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be less. Yeah, it won't be less. Okay, um, that's fine. We're not changing the system, so no, 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 no. But I just wonder, yeah. tighter or whatever. I would think. Yeah, I would think. Okay, They're down to. So one of those is less than fifty, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> with carpet and tile. Good. Um, Anything else? Oh, I don't have any questions. No, I'm good. Okay, so we'll vote this next time. I, I just, yeah, if we could, I don't want to add, but just looking, thinking about Ripley and its longer, long lifespan. Sure, we'll find, yeah, we'll pull the energy out it. I get found it them already. Good. Um, let's see here. Well, I do have one question. For there you me. go. I'm looking for a question. Here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, forgive me. I found it. Ah. <laughs> Sanborn Life Safety. Okay, Sanborn Life Safety. I just wanted to make sure it was still in there. Yep. You. Okay. Yep. We need it in there. And so how how much have we exciting. dipped into that this year? You know, uh, right now we you can carry it over yep. from year to year. So okay. I think there's a, I think there's a still a hundred grand in there. Okay. Um, uh, we're never sure. We're never when something sure. Happens. I no, I'm not. Oh, yeah. I'm not advocating to take it away. I just. The heat wasn't working, so yes. you hold yeah. your breath and hope it's not. I know. Hundreds yeah, we of definitely did some dollars. Yeah. 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 I can get you. Okay. All right. Well, I think we have reached the end of our agenda. Great. And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, um, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Hi. Hello, school committee. Um, sorry, I wanted to pop in earlier, but I've been toggling back and forth between this and the CPC hearing, which is at the same time this evening. I appreciate your um, discussion on the um, capital plan for uh, the high school and the discussion about the amenities building. I would, I would um, remind you that the peak debt years associated with the middle school will be 26, 27, and 28. Mm -hmm. And to take that into consideration as you discuss the timing of when you're going to ask for these projects to be done. And um, I would echo some of the comments earlier about um, looking for ways to self fund some of these projects, either through the athletic uh, revolving fund or through the use of the stabilization reserve that you established. Um, this, this is going to be a tough time right so. I get it. I understand that you have some capital needs, but mm -hmm. timing isn't great. Yep. Oh, so, thank you for the feedback. Yep. Very thank good. you. Thank you. And on the middle school court. <laughs> yes. 
keep that number down. I don't want it coming up after Thursday. I understand what you guys are doing, um, but I'm really hoping that number is not coming up based on ventilation, that if we, it needs to, that there's an offset. I uh, am confident the building committee has heard both you and the select board um, and uh, we'll, we'll do our very best. I know you will. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Have a good night. Good night. All right. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Anderson, aye. Who's aye? Rana, aye. Rainy, aye. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.